Welcome to Ballot Battleground Nevada. I'm your host, Ben Marjot, a reporter at KRNV News 4 in Reno. I'm passionate about making politics in this critical battleground state more digestible to the average voter and pushing past the talking points to press politicians for answers. On this show, we take deep dives into the people, ideas, and debates shaping Silver State politics. It started off slow, but ended up being one of the most hectic election days I can remember. Not because of the election per se, that went pretty smoothly. No major issues and pretty low turnout, unfortunately. But rather, two different brush fires burning in the Reno Sparks area, threatening people's homes. We, of course, will stick to the political news here on this show, but wow, what a day. We have another jam-packed episode this week, a full recap and breakdown of the primary election and results from all angles, talking to voters, election officials, candidates, one candidate calling me a sham journalist. We will get to all of it this week. We'll take you there and hear from our reporters on the ground to get their perspective. You'll hear from reporters Kim Burrows and Audrey Mayer a little bit later. But first, we'll start from the beginning. Normally, there's a surge of Election Day voters early on Election Day, first thing in the morning. That was not the case this time. Let's take you out to South Valley's library as the polls opened at 7 a.m. We heard from Washoe County's Interim Registrar of Voters, Carrie Ann Burgess. It is Election Day for the primary in Nevada. I'm so excited, so excited. We actually are in South Valley's. We are here at a polling location, and when they opened this morning, we had a line. So that is good news. I'm really excited about that. In the first two hours of Election Day voting, just 1,300 people had voted all across Washoe County. We caught up with a few of them. Well, it was wonderful this morning. There's no line. The people at the desk were very helpful. I, Like I say, I haven't voted in person for years. So it was kind of fun to get my I voted sticker and use the machine. The machine was fine, no harm, no foul. Now my husband's still in there because his didn't like his card, but I was good. So yeah, I I came in before work, uh, walked in, voted in person. Uh, Pretty easy process. There's been a lot of advertisement about the primary election. I know a lot of people don't necessarily vote during the primary, but I like to come in person and it was an easy process for me. I just like to be a part of the democratic process, and this is part of doing it. I always vote, and one thing I know, it's going to be 99 today. I got in and out in five minutes, so I'm happy. Absolutely. Off to work. By noon, when I voted at Wooster High School's polling place, only 32 people had voted there all day. Finally, in the mid-afternoon, it seemed like things were picking up. We saw our first line of the day starting to form at Reno High School. We were there to catch up with Sam Brown, the front runner in the GOP Senate primary, voting at his neighborhood polling place and answering a few questions in a short press gaggle outside. I'm so excited. Um, it's uh, like this is uh, a very important day in the in the you know next step of uh, this election season. Um, there's there's a lot to be excited about. How do you feel about being endorsed by President Trump? Oh, I'm I'm thrilled. Thrilled to have uh, the president's endorsement, and uh, and just know that uh, he's he's got a real um, clear path to to winning back the White House. Uh, we can also win back the majority in the Senate uh, through through Nevada. Listeners will remember that Brown didn't do an interview with us for our Know Your Candidates 2024 series, so this was the first time we had gotten to talk to him since he filed to run for office back in March. We had a long list of questions ready, but only got time to ask one. Brown last week got the endorsement of former President Donald Trump, and he has called the trial and conviction against former President Trump a sham. We wanted him to elaborate on that. Take a listen. You called the trial against former President Trump a sham. What what about that trial made it a sham to you? You know, Ben, today we're just focused on uh, getting out the vote, uh, getting through the primary day. But since we haven't uh, gotten to speak to you since the trial concluded, what what about that trial was a sham? You you know, Ben, it's uh, again, we're we're focused on uh, primary election day. Um, There's there's clearly been um, a a, a very dramatic contrast and difference between uh, Trump's administration and this administration uh, when it comes to all sorts of policies. But we'll talk about it another time. Let's just let's just uh, encourage voters well, to get out to vote today. Speaker, a majority. As you heard there, despite asking twice and pressing to get an answer, 
Brown did not answer. We put that clip up on social media, and the reaction from the right was strong. The eventual second-place finisher, Dr. Jeff Gunter, jumped all over it. He's tried to position himself as 110% Trump in this race, and he took to Twitter calling Brown a scam and a total McConnell swamp rhino, his words there. The clip started picking up steam as MAGA voters across the country started piling on. Three hours later, Brown took to social media to answer our question, tweeting this, quote, Nice try, Ben. I've been on record on this for months. The weaponization of the legal system against President Trump must stop. President Trump has been targeted by his opponent's Justice Department and was subjected to a kangaroo court decision that was purely political and designed to attack the political opponent of Joe Biden. This will all end in November when President Trump is elected by the people. We'll point out that the case was not brought by the Biden Justice Department, rather the local district attorney Alvin Bragg in Manhattan. I thought that might be the end of this, but Brown, a short time after, took to Twitter again with a two-minute long video calling me a sham journalist for asking that question and clarifying again his position on the Trump trial. Take a listen. Clearly, New York City voted 95 percent against President Donald J. Trump in 2020. It is a sham that he could find an objective jury of his peers when all there was were anti-Trumpers filling that courtroom. So we've got a lot of problems with this case. And the proof is that Americans aren't buying this sham trial either. When President Trump raised almost a half a billion dollars from small dollar donors all across this country, when this verdict came out, you know that I'm not the only one that believes this. So I've been on the record for months. Let's have our sham journalist do a little bit better job of doing their research and covering the facts. He posted this video when I was at the Renaissance Hotel to cover his own watch party. We'll get to that in just a minute, but what a wild turn of events. By that time, the action was ramping up at the Washoe County Registrar's Office. Polls closed at 7 p.m. and election workers were working furiously to process mail ballots and the cartridges from voting kiosks as they started to come in. Now it's a waiting game. We heard the last voter in Washoe County had voted around 7.30, the last Clark County voter voting a short time later, and it was time for the Secretary of State to begin releasing results. Compared to previous cycles, the results came fast, and the margins were so big that races started to be called almost immediately. Democratic Senator Jackie Rosen, she was up by almost 90 points, and the Associated Press projected her to win right away. Sam Brown was up by 40-plus points on Jeff Gunter and the rest of the primary field, and the AP projected him as the winner of the GOP Senate primary. Northern Nevada Republican Representative Mark Amaday up by 30 or so points on primary challenger Fred Simon, and that race was called as well. The race calls for state legislative races started coming in shortly thereafter. We won't get to all the results for legislative and local races on this show, but go to our website, mynews4.com, for our full results page. I'll put a link in the show notes. Let's head back out to the Renaissance Hotel as Army Captain Sam Brown took the stage to applause from friends, family, and supporters gathered inside and delivered a victory speech. Wow. Wow, what a night. The American dream is not dead, and the American nightmare under Joe Biden and Jackie Rosen begins to end tonight. The crisis on the border is totally created by Joe Biden. The crisis on the border has led to deaths of so many Americans from fentanyl and opioid overdoses. Rosen wasn't available for an interview on her win, but released the following statement, which reads in part, quote, Nevadans know my record of working across party lines to get results and taking on special interests to lower costs. It's why I'm ranked one of the most bipartisan, independent, and effective members of the Senate. I'm proud of the work I've done with both parties to rebuild our infrastructure with good-paying jobs, support our veterans, and invest in local law enforcement. My opponent is a MAGA extremist who will say anything to get elected. Sam Brown's far-right agenda of banning abortion, even in the case of rape or incest, phasing out Social Security and Medicare, abolishing the Department of Education, and reviving Yucca Mountain as a nuclear waste dump, would be a disaster for Nevada and hardworking families across our state. 
And we'll point out here that back in 2022, Brown did say that not having Yucca Mountain operational represented a, quote, incredible loss of revenue for our state. But in late May, he backtracked and tweeted that he has spent time speaking with engineers and experts on Yucca Mountain and said that it is abundantly clear that the project is dead and that he will stand with President Trump to oppose it when he's in the U.S. Senate. After another batch of results dropped close to midnight, election night was just about over. Almost all the legislative races were called by the Associated Press, reporters and election workers, candidates alike. We all called it a night which is why we're so grateful now to be joined by two of our reporters who put in long, late hours to bring you the very latest information on election night. Political reporter Audrey Mayer was tracking the landscape of the state legislature races, and investigative reporter Kim Burroughs was live at the registrar's office all night long. We are all a little sleep-deprived, but we wanted to bring you there by hearing from the people on the ground. Here's our post-election wrap-up conversation with Audrey and Kim. Audrey Mayer, Kim Burroughs, so excited to be joined by the two of you here on the podcast. in the studio for the podcast after the election. We're all sleep deprived, as I mentioned in the <laughs> intro to this segment. A little groggy. So I really appreciate how you guys holding up. How late did you guys work last night? I was here till after midnight and then rolled home and saw you, Ben, doing live reports <laughs> on fires that were yeah. breaking out. It was it was a long night last night, but elections you always know are going to be long. The fire yeah. just threw in a little extra coverage. Two fires, not just Two one. Fires. Two fires. Yeah, I did a Facebook Live from the scene and one of them at like 1230, got to bed at one or something. How was your night, Audrey? Again. Yeah, so as our news director shared in an email, this was not a boring night. Not only <laughs> did we have the election day, which is always chaotic, but... Like you said, we had two fires and we had our fearless reporters out there just mm. getting, you know, all the interviews and the information. So um, we had just really good people on the ground, not yeah. only covering the elections, but also the breaking news. Yeah, we were at <laughs> News 4, not to brag about our station, but I will. We were all over it, all yep. over all the angles of breaking news, the election. We were at the election headquarters, of course. And also the fire headquarters last night. Still, uh, for me personally, not as crazy as the last election, the primary, I should say, when I was in the hospital. My son had just been born the <laughs> night right. before. My <laughs> wife's water broke the day before the election. So we spent last election in the hospital, this election covering fires and but all the rest. Selfishly, so we wanted you here. We were excited you were having a kid, but <laughs> yeah. selfishly, it was like yeah. our political reporter's gone, our content manager's gone. What are we going to do? Yeah, and arguably the two most important people <laughs> right? that you need in the building. But, but we got a good son out of it. I, great and timing, <laughs> Sage. You couldn't have waited two days. <laughs> watching election results come in as I'm like, got my newborn son on my chest two years ago at this time. Core memory for sure. Also a core memory, not a core memory, but wild memories from last night. So yeah. let's let's dig into it. We'll start with you, Kim, because you had uh, the job of being at the Washoe County Registrar's Office yet again. That's kind of like your hangout spot mm -hmm. for elections. You were there in February for the presidential preference primary. For folks who didn't listen to that episode, uh, go back and listen to it. Yeah. But uh, we'll just we'll start from what, what's it like being in there? It's it's kind of the hub of where all the activity is on election night. Describe it for our listeners. It is. That is where everything comes in. That is ground zero, if you will, that all the ballots get counted, all the ballots get sorted, everything gets checked in. So it's kind of a buzz of, as you know, you've been there many times, it's a buzz of activity and the energy in there is so fun. But this time around, it was different. Yeah, what was different about it? Well, so this is the first election that we've had here in Washoe County and across the state that the registrar and the staff members there can open the ballots and start counting those ballots, as you know, Ben, before in the past, we've had the elections close, the polls close at 7 o'clock. We couldn't start counting those ballots until after 7 o'clock. So everything kind of backed up and jammed up. Yeah. And at 7 o'clock, it was a flurry of activity. Well, this year, we watched the live feed from down at the registrar's office, and it was a bustling at like noon at yeah. two o'clock they started counting the ballots actually at 10 30 in the morning none of those results can be released but they start sure. counting them that's great it makes for a slightly earlier night for it all is. of us uh, of. <laughs> and we get results a little bit earlier in the night we we all love that because nevada was kind of uh, the laughing stock of the country in, in the last presidential cycle because it took so long. So to have a couple extra hours, you know, half a day or so to kind of get ahead of it. And it is counted. Great. It mattered. Like you could see when I walked in, we're working a late shift. So I came in at about two o'clock, got over there about two thirty, and it was it was a bustling 
And then everything kind of died down by four o'clock. And in years past, I mean, that was we'd be doing live shots and showing the sorting machine yeah. buzzing around. Nothing was happening at four and five <laughs> o'clock. They kind of shut everything down, got some numbers to the Secretary of State's office. They said at about four or five o'clock. Uh, and it was slow until the polls closed again at seven o'clock. And then about 45 minutes later, all the results and all those, you know, um, ballots from the voting locations, the 20 or the 49 vote centers came in uh, and then it started bustling again. And it was down to the end. We were doing live shots at 10 o'clock and 11 yeah. o'clock. And these, they had new this year, they had a board of sticky notes with all the voting locations. And every time one would come <laughs> in, they'd say, okay, um, Idaho <laughs> Park or whatever would come in and they'd rip it off and it would be fun. So we had like five down to the last like 10 o'clock and we're like come on and the last <laughs> one this year was reno high school and reno everybody high. cheered when the fast just before the 11 o'clock news and in years past the last presidential preference primary yeah. we had the front lobby of the washoe county center where the registers office that, right. was the last one to come in and they couldn't <laughs> they let all their staff go and they couldn't get the results faster but that this year wild. it was all done by 11 o'clock everybody was in and they were going home for the night couple hours later than that, but they actually got some sleep last night. <laughs> Glad to hear that for all of them. Uh, I remember one cycle, it was Incline Village, which makes sense. Yeah, you know, it's over the far. hill, but yeah, in the presidential preference primary, it was in the building at the registrar's <laughs> office, which was funny. Set the scene for us because there's like the observer area where people are kind of behind in the fishbowl with glass. Reporters are kind of cordoned off to one side. Describe the ballot sorting machine and what happens in, in the garage out back. It's really cool. If you haven't seen it, it's it's really, I did Facebook Lives on it, and we've got some information. The cars come in. They get checked in with their IDs. The cars come into the basement of the, of the county complex building, um, and staff members grab those ballots. They haul them inside. They go right to the sorting machine, and the sorting machine's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Audrey, you've been there, too, where the, the ballots just... And you just see these ballots go flying through and they get sorted off. Then they get opened. Then they get counted. Well, that takes staff members to open all that. New, this next coming election, that is the last year for that sorting machine. Yeah. We're getting a new sorting machine and we're getting a new extractor. Doesn't that sound exciting? Ooh, the extractor. county has got two at the end of January that they're getting. So instead of all the staff members having to open those envelopes, they're going to have an extractor that opens them, preps them, and gets them ready to count. And then it goes into the sorting machine and, you know... It's all done electronically now. You don't need so many staff members. Yeah, that's another thing that will hopefully streamline this process yeah. and make things a little bit easier. There's so much more legwork and manual labor that goes into it now a with ton. all these mail ballots, whereas, you know, with these cartridges, as you describe it, they essentially bring in, you know, they drive in, they have this little secure bag, and it's like, a, for lack of a better term, a, a thumb drive you plug yeah. into the computer and all the results are downloaded. Whereas with these mail, mail ballots, it's obviously a single piece of paper for every single ballot. So a lot more work that goes into it, the more technology they can have to kind of ease that burden is, of course, a good thing. They're going to show it off to the media. They want to make sure it's up and running. It's supposed to be the end of this month in June. Cool. Uh, so they're going to get it up and running, and then they'll tout it off to us, and we'll show all the viewers and the people at home. Yeah, looking forward to seeing that. Any other funny or unique moments from last night that kind of uh, stand out to you? Oh, we've got this down to a science now. <laughs> it was good. You know, it's pizza night. We all have a little piece of pizza and and plow through these live reports. Um, everything just last night, the overall feeling I felt, it wasn't as chaotic. Things were running much smoother. There yeah. was a lot more hustle and bustle throughout the day rather than cramming it all in the in the evening. And everything seemed to run smoothly. The observers that are in this fishbowl, if you will, there's about a handful of them. They can't have cell phones. They kind of watch what's going on with the process. If they have questions, if they have concerns, they can raise that. Oh, here's something interesting last mm -hmm. night. The sheriff, Sheriff Darren Balaam with Washoe okay. County showed up. He said he had never been down to the registrar's office to huh. see the process. He was thrilled by the sorting machine. <laughs> yeah. He thought that was so funny. Yeah. He stayed the whole evening. He handed out, I think, some cookies at the end when they were coming through the garage. They would hand out cookies to people. He stayed the whole evening, and he absolutely loved the process. He saw us. Uh, we're cordoned off. The media is so we can get a good view of the room, but we're off on one side so the observers can know that what we're doing. You can't get into that room without an escort. You can't have any trash yeah. cans in that room because they're afraid that something may nefarious may happen. Yeah. Um, we can't have anything outside of our little corner. We can't even slip out the back garage. We have to go out the front door because it is that room is completely locked down to make sure it's secure. But it was kind of nice to see the sheriff down there poking around with us. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool even to the officials who you yeah. know, are used to doing that. But that's funny. It's his first time yep. down there. So, Kim, thank you so much for all your you hard work it. last night that's reporting fun. out there at the election.
very cool place to be. Another place that is bustling and buzzing on an election night, of course, is the newsroom here mm-hmm. at the kind of the beating heart of our news operation, which is where Audrey was for most of the evening, kind of taking a broader look at some of the races and, that we've just talked about previously on this show. As it comes to the Nevada legislature, you were our reporter, one of our reporters, along with me down at the legislature this past legislative session. So it's in your wheelhouse. Before we get into that specifically, what's the atmosphere of the newsroom for our listeners who are, who are wondering? Yeah, so it was actually interesting for me to be here in the newsroom and in the studio because usually I'm out in the field, yeah. you know, getting voters uh, interviews and just looking at all the uh, polling locations. So it was kind of a unique experience for me to be in the newsroom for the first time. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, calm at times and then chaotic at times. We did get a lot of breaking news yesterday, mm-hmm. which... You you know, when it rains, it storms, I guess, because <laughs> we, two fires in one day, that's not something that happens all the time. So we just really stretched our staff and really were, were able to manage it all, which was really great. Um, and yeah, I, I, it was just you know, election days are like our Super Bowl. So it's yeah. really exciting to <laughs> just see how well we work together as a team and seeing everyone just putting in their best effort. I so agree. It was great. It'd be like if there were two fires on the same day as the Super Bowl. <laughs> That's you know, a big one. Exactly. Put an election in yeah. there now. <laughs> um, set the stage for us as it pertains to the legislature for listeners who didn't listen to previous episodes. What is kind of the landscape Democrats have control in both chambers of Nevada's legislature, the Senate and the Assembly. Tell us about that. Yeah, so Ben, you've done extensive reporting on this, as you know, but the state assembly already has a two-thirds supermajority. So what that means is... For the Democrats. For the Democrats, yes. So um, what that means is if both houses were able to get a two-thirds supermajority, they could potentially override a veto from Governor Joe Lombardo. So the state Senate is just one seat short for the Democrats to be able to have a supermajority. So if Democrats... Democrats hold on to all of their seats and then just get one more in the state Senate, they would be able to override a veto of Governor Joe Lombardo. And he did veto several bills in yeah, the last 75. Yeah, yep. 75 bills in the last legislative session. So this would really have a huge difference in the balance of power, balance of power at the state legislature. Absolutely. Not only the veto power, but also the power to raise or change the tax structure in Nevada to approve new new taxes. You could override anything uh, that the governor would veto to where um, even though there is a a Republican in the governor's mansion, Democrats would essentially have carte blanche power to enact whatever policies they so choose if they flip one seat in the Senate, keep all their seats in the assembly. One of the seats uh, that is perhaps most likely to be flipped or that Democrats are definitely targeting Senate District 15 up here in Reno. Longtime Senator Heidi Gansert said she wasn't running for it Mm -hmm. again. And uh, Democrats redrew that district to be a little more in their favor. It previously was kind of a lean Republican district. Tell us briefly kind of about the two primaries that were going on for that seat and who ended up winning from those races. For, for the Democrats, uh, Dr. Angie Taylor won uh, her primary race against uh, her closest opponent was Naomi Dewar, who of course is the vice mayor and uh, Reno City Councilwoman. So we uh, we kind of thought those two would be the main contenders in the Democrats uh, race. And so uh, Dr. Angie Taylor came out with the win on that one. And then for the Republicans. Um, Mike Ginsburg came out with the win on his side. He is endorsed by uh, Heidi Gansert, who previously held that seat. So those are the two candidates that will be running against each other in November. Yeah, that matchup is set. So it's Mike Ginsburg on the Republican side and Angie Taylor on the Democratic side. She's an assemblywoman currently. Mm-hmm. So um, having already been in the legislature, perhaps she was the the slight favorite. And I believe she had the endorsement of the uh, the Democratic caucus. But she had um, a but, name out there just in Reno, too, because she was such a big part, of the, part of the community. Yeah, and she was the president of the Washoe County School That's Board right. and on the school board of trustees for a very long time. So um, Naomi Dewar, a big name in this community as well, um, but did not win that race. So it is set. Mike Ginsburg, Angie Taylor for the big race that everyone's going to be watching when it comes to November. Any other observations or takeaways, Audrey, that you noticed from kind of tracking um, some of these uh, legislative races last night? 
Yeah, so one thing I will will say is we did uh, speak with Dr. Angie Taylor after she, you know, won her race. And she just talked about, you know, all the effort that gets put into these campaigns, knocking on doors, talking to voters for months. And so I guess uh, this is just really the culmination of just a lot of hard work by not only, you know, us reporters following all these races, but also the candidates trying to get their name out there. So um, it'll be really interesting to see it all ramp up even further in just a few months. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot yeah. of stuff coming up for November. It's it takes, exciting. Yeah, and to just put the, I'll say this too, it takes a lot to like put yourself out there to run a campaign, to do interviews, to do all of that. So um, for all the candidates that do that, like good for them. Good you know? for them. That's a lot. putting yourself out there. And the criticism that they get. You get a lot of criticism, especially in this day and age. <laughs> um, so I appreciate the candidates doing it. appreciate the election workers that make this thing happen. So many of them are volunteers. Like, Elections yeah. could not run without the people volunteering their time, right, Kim? Carrie Ann Burgess, our uh, Registrar Voters Addressed, actually, we asked her about the threat and just kind of the, the hot temperament and the culture that's going on right now that that um, I believe she left a job previously because she yeah. had felt some heat uh, in the Midwest that she moved on and did something else. And then now she's coming back to it. And we asked her, have you received direct threats? And she said, I have not. But yeah. she said, I changed the way that I used to to be. She doesn't go to the grocery store and linger around in the community. Wow. She goes to work, she comes home, and she just does her job. But she just says that it's just the culture right now is just a little too volatile, that yeah. she is on TV, people are getting to know who she is, and she just doesn't want to make herself a target in the community for uh, either negative behavior or something threatening that could come her way. So she's a different person, she says, in the way she behaves in the community. And it makes me sad a little bit yeah. that she just can't do her job. I mean, she was hired to do this job and just make sure the process works. And she just can't even do that, she feels, in some some sense. That's a shame. And, yeah, we've reported on it quite a bit, too. But that led to the departure of the former former registrar, right. Deanna Spicula. And That's then right. Jamie Rodriguez was the registrar in between for a short time. She, she left as too. well. I'm mm -hmm. sure she felt that. Yep. So it is a shame because these people are just trying to do a job and make these elections run as smoothly as they possibly can. And the cameras are up and the observers are there. So, I mean, they're doing everything they can to make sure everything's transparent. I don't know. I can't come up with something that she could do even more. I mean, we already have enough checks and balances, I believe, to make sure that the process in that basement of the uh, Washoe County uh, uh, office, the registers of voters, I just don't know another way that you could make it even more transparent. She's, I think she's doing a pretty good job. I've saw it firsthand for several elections with her. Yeah. She started as in this job as an interim in January, and she's been with the county since last fall. So Yeah, and it sounds like after, now that this election has kind of wrapped up, once they uh, certify and canvas all of the results is when the county will decide on whether or not to make her permanent right. or to hire someone else. So we'll be tracking that closely. Um, throughout the summer. So let's end on a lighter note. What's a funny story, anecdote, just a memory from covering this election, whether it was from last night or kind of in the months leading up to it, something that stands out to both of you guys. Something completely off the cuff that is not <laughs> even election hardly related, but people at home might find this funny. Yeah. We got big giant burritos last night instead of pizza. <laughs> yeah. And we're eating these burritos in the registrar's office. I'm wearing a nice white shirt underneath <laughs> and the avocado went all down uh, the front of my little thing. So if you look closely you at 10, you could probably find some avocado on Kim's shirt. And guess what? The news goes on. <laughs> Absolutely. I was going to bring up the burritos too, Kim, but <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have a slightly different anecdote, I guess. So usually, you know, pizza is the thing right. reporters and the whole newsroom gets on election night. And, you know, when, when we're out in the field, we make friends with, of course, the press corps and everything. So there was a little debate on whether we liked pineapple on pizza. But, of course, <laughs> um, now we had burritos. So we're just changing it up a bit. Here. And I thought we won because everybody gets pizza. And we had right, these big, right. giant burritos <laughs> that were locally made. So we're, we were thrilled by everyone was looking at us saying, you guys got burritos? And yeah. they were delivered to me because I couldn't leave. So it was fantastic. And I'll give a shout out before we wrap up here to our digital content producer, Ken Dunn, who was delivering burritos. I don't know if he, he brought them to you, with Kim. Us, yes. He brought them to us like at the perfect time. Yep. And to all the people in the, in the newsroom who made it go on, it's not just um, those of us that are on camera that that you right. see it's the photographers it's the producers it's our web team it's our managers Management. it's mm -hmm. 
people in master control. It's it's all of those people. And so. one last thought. We yeah. had our graphics go down all right before <laughs> right. the newscast. So all our IT guys were on overdrive trying to get everything back up and running. So it was truly the Super Bowl <laughs> and a tornado all in one day. <laughs> yeah, you plan for as much as you possibly can. There's always going to be one or two or in last night's case, five things that go wrong <laughs> and that are unexpected. But we roll with the punches. And to the bring burrito you guys. wins. <laughs> <laughs> we bring you guys as much and as the most comprehensive election coverage that we possibly can. So, Kim, Audrey, great job last night. Thanks for making time for you us. You too, Ben. Great Even job Even though to we're you, all sleep deprived here on this Wednesday morning. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk again probably in November. Sounds good. <laughs> See you then. One last reminder for all results for federal, state, and local races, go to our website, mynews4.com. It will be updated as more results come in from those mail ballots that trickle in over the next day or so. If you made it to the end of this episode, I really appreciate it. If you have guest ideas, episode ideas, questions, comments, compliments, concerns, anything at all, feel free to shoot us an email to bjmarjot, M-A-R-G-I-O-T-T, at sbgtv.com and put Ballot Battleground Nevada in the subject line. And if you have a minute, I'd really appreciate it if you left a rating and a review. That helps the podcast show up higher in searches so more people can discover the show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next week.